A couple of you have mentioned having a company and then taking it public. I'd like you to mention, it. was there any difference in working in the company after it became public? So, uh, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Substantial. First of all, being public is a tax. So there's a trade-off. So once you're public, you... Uh, you have access to capital in a pretty efficient way as long as your company is successful in meeting plans. It is, however, a more expensive way um, to operate your company. So, you know, if you have uh, an auditor come in and audit your company as a private company, it will cost you, you know, let's just say for grins, it's $100,000. Uh, Tweeter's audit fees last year were a million eight. So, um, in addition to being public, you now have a very different rule set in terms of, you know, the compliance community really is working very hard to try to find people's scalps to hang on its wall. And so SEC reviews have gone from being, uh, you know, I say a moderately painful exercise to extremely expensive. The last SEC review that Twitter went through, and keep in mind, Tweeters never had a restatement, never had an issue, and it's had five SEC reviews. The very first SEC review, I did myself, I faxed my answers over to my lawyer, he called me up later that day, and it was okay. We faxed it into the SEC, it was done. I think my bill from the lawyer was $1,000. I think the bill from the accountants was a little more. The last SEC review we had, we had to have a board meeting, two audit committee meetings, three separate attorneys, um, sign off by Deloitte and Touche's national office, and the review cost $225,000 of professional fees to answer 52 questions posed to us by a hired examiner from the SEC who really didn't know much about the retail method of accounting. So that piece of it is pretty frustrating. So there's kind of two points of view with that. You know, I will tell you that having been a public company for a long time, that I see the government, you know, it's a pendulum that really swings. And so as all pendulums swing, you know, they spend very little time in the middle, right? <laughs> they spend more time swinging up or more time swinging down. And so the regulatory environment is a tax, and, and the, the pendulum is the best example I can give you. So. What I advise companies today, and I get asked this question a lot, um, and I'll, I'll hear it particularly from business owners who want to take their company public because they want a liquidity event. You'll have people who've worked 20 years in their business, they've achieved the amount of success, but 90% of their net worth is tied up in their business, and they're maybe in their mid-40s or 50s, and it's feeling like risk, and they want to take some money off the table. and. Um, Having an IPO and going public in America today still has a certain amount of romance attached to it that I think is actually misplaced. There are lots of ways to go about having a liquidity event in your business that doesn't necessarily require an IPO. And I will tell you today that given the regulatory environment and the cost of doing that, that the hurdle for the size company that should be public uh, is probably higher today than it's been in the past. You know, it used to be if you were doing 25 to 30 million bucks and you really had a great idea and were going to grow, you could take your company public. I would tell you that it would, and it happens still today, particularly in technology, you'll see that more often than not. But in a consumer products company, in a retail company, in a transaction oriented company, um, I would tell you that that hurdle is going to be a lot higher because you have to be of a, of a large enough size to be able to afford the tax and your back office really needs to be mature enough to be able to deal with the compliance and regulatory requirements that exist as a public company today. They're real and significant and you know Congress has passed special laws that you know they really made the CEO and the CFO very jail eligible. And as you run larger companies, um, you take those things that you have to sign, you know, I sign them every quarter, very seriously. Because, you know, when you've got 4,000 people in your company and you've got 130 people in your accounting department, you, there was a time when the company was smaller when I signed every check and I knew every transaction. I, you know, I, I would have been very comfortable when the company was 50 million signing. When the company was 800 million, did I really know that every single transaction had been absolutely accounted for, absolutely perfect, that I had personal knowledge of that? No way. It's impossible, right? 
75,000 transactions a month. Uh, you just, you can't. So you're very reliant then on staff, on systems, on a series of internal controls to make sure that everything gets disclosed to you. And, um, and so it's a very, very different um, environment. When you just own your own business, honestly, you're accountable to yourself and your employees. When you have outside investors, whether they're private investors because it's a hedge fund or a venture fund or the, or the public at large, you now have a whole other constituency that you're responsible for and responsible to, right? They've given you their money, you're now a steward of their capital, and they're entitled to a return on it. So um, it's just a very different environment to operate it. The business model, whether you're public or private, the things you have to do to satisfy your customers doesn't change at all. The administration piece 